So, um, um, this might not be as compelling an answer as Hobbes would say. What would Hobbes say the point of morality is? What would Hobbes say the point of justice is? That's what justice is. What's the point? Why is it something that you should care about? It's law of the state of nature. Is that right, and why should I care about staying out of the state of nature? Because they are more. Yeah, why should I die. tell you about that? Because I'm going to die. All right, so for Hobbes, the reason to care about justice, the reason to care about morality, is because it will serve my interests. So if Hobbes could pull that off, and I express doubt about whether he can, if he could pull that off, that would be a really compelling reason to be concerned about morality. So, if, if, you, if you ask Hobbes, why should I be concerned about morality? What's the point of it? And the answer is, to serve your own interests. That seems like a pretty compelling reason. A utilitarian can't say that, necessarily. A utilitarian can't say, it's to serve your own interests. But a utilitarian can say something here. It's to serve somebody's interests. It's to serve the aggregate interest. It's to serve the overall satisfaction of interests, even if not simply your own. So maybe that's not quite as compelling as Hobbes, but at least there's something to say there. That what's objectively good is the satisfaction of anybody's desires, and utilitarianism does that better than any other theory. It maximizes. And a final attraction, so that was that it can answer the question, why care about morality or what's the point of morality? Uh, a final attractive feature um, is that it embodies this impartiality. So it suggests that nobody's desires, nobody's subjective good, is any more intrinsically important than anybody else's. So th there's a kind of equality or impartiality at the base of utilitarianism. So it apparently treats everyone as equals. And this feature of utilitarianism, I mean, this is the impartiality part. This feature of utilitarianism was, in fact, one of the main attractions of utilitarianism as it was developed in the late 18th and early 19th centuries. Um, so the theorists who developed modern utilitarianism, people like Jeremy Bentham and um, then James Mill, John Stuart Mill, these folks were radical reformers. They were developing moral theories in the context of very hierarchical societies. Um, and think about this. Their idea, after all, was that the satisfaction of anyone's desires is just as important as the satisfaction of anyone else's desires. The satisfaction of the lowliest peasant's desires is just as important as the satisfaction of the king's desires. So this was a doctrine of really radical equality, that everybody's desires, the satisfaction of everybody's desires counts. Um, so Bentham had a famous slogan about this, that in utilitarianism, everyone counts for one and none for more than one. And everybody's subjective desires get thrown into the pot together, nobody's are any more intrinsically important than anybody else's. The king doesn't count for more than one, the lowest peasant doesn't count for less than one. Okay. I need the next slide, I really do. Alright, quick. Problems with utilitarianism. Um, the first is this. This idea of everyone counting for one and none for more than one, this idea of e 
equality really is potentially misleading because it's not the case. It's not the case that everybody counts equally. Really what's the case is every desire counts equally. Um, so there's a sense in which people, you might say, really don't count at all. People, human beings, are just maybe the location where desires are found. We're like carriers of desires. Uh, and there's no sense that we are all equal. Our desires are all equal. Um, and so here comes a criticism of utilitarianism. Um, it says something like this. Since utilitarianism is only concerned with maximizing overall happiness, there's really no concern with how that happiness is distributed among different individuals. So you might think that what utilitarianism requires is an equal distribution of happiness among all individuals. But that's not right, or that's not necessarily right. Utilitarianism is not directly concerned with who has how much happiness. It's only concerned with maximizing the total amount. So if the way to maximize the total amount is to distribute it equally, fine. If the way to maximize the total amount is to distribute it unequally, it should be distributed unequally. So you may have heard the slogan, the greatest happiness for the greatest number, as a way of describing these alternatives. But you can see now that this is ambiguous. It's ambiguous because uh, the greatest number of people being happy might not be the way to make the greatest total amount of happiness. So here's the chart illustrating this. What we have here going down on the left side is uh, I've numbered 100 people. Person 1, person 2, person 3, person 4, up to 100. And here we have, in the columns, we have three different possible arrangements of society. And I've given a number here in each of these to indicate how happy the, that person is under that arrangement. So this is going to be a level of utility, maybe some measure of the satisfaction of the OK, my question is, under A, B, or C, which one best represents the idea that greatest happiness for the greatest number? I myself think that, well, I don't know what I think about that. So you notice on A, everybody is equally happy. Everybody has the same level of happiness. Under B, we have two people who are made less happy. But most people, 98 out of 100, are made much happier. And of course, under C, we have one person made extremely happy. And everybody else, even more unhappy. OK, so the greatest happiness for the greatest number. Well, if we're just looking at the greatest happiness, the answer is what? C. C. So in fact, utilitarianism will choose C. That's where the greatest aggregate satisfaction and desires lies. It doesn't really seem like that's the greatest happiness for the greatest number, though. I don't know, maybe, maybe B seems like a nice balance between a lot of happiness for a lot of people, even though it's not the greatest amount or for the greatest number. Yeah. Uh, could you have, uh, like, could you have in C, column C maybe how person one is the happiest? Could it mean anything that, like, going from one to two would mean a lot more than person two? Then person one going from 10,000 to 10,000 one? Is there like two tiers of this? This is supposed to be, so this is supposed to be their level of happiness. So it's not like how rich they are. This is not supposed to be dollars or something like that. This is supposed to be just a measure of happiness. Okay, and so your question is, what if we take away one unit of happiness here and add one unit of happiness here? What would that do to the total? Not a trick question. If we 
you subtract one from here and add one to here, what's going to be? Right, it's going to stay the same. So strictly speaking, from a utilitarian point of view, no difference. Now, we could imagine a sort of mm, modified utilitarianism that says, what we're supposed to do is maximize overall utility, maximize overall utility, uh, but in cases of ties, go for equality. Sure, why not? But the point is that what happens if what happens if lowering that person's ten thousand? Uh, uh, do it the other way around. What happens if we could raise that person's ten thousand to ten thousand and ten by taking away maybe a half a unit of utility from someone else? Is that a good trade-off? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Notice, notice what's going on here. Uh, this is the answer to your earlier question. That util utilitarianism is going to allow for the sacrifice of one person's happiness if that decrease is compensated by an increase or a greater increase for one or more other individuals. Okay. And this, in fact, is sort of built into the, the very idea of utilitarianism. It's built into the idea of taking this impartial point of view. It doesn't matter where the desires are located, that is, in which container they're located, whether they're my desires or yours. So they're all thrown together. Um, so let me say that again. Do it, do it this way. From the first column where there's equality, uh, some, you know, from the first column, from column A to column B, two people were made less happy, 98 were made more happy, much more happy, and that's something that a utilitarian would go along with. That loss is outweighed by the greater gain elsewhere. Is that clear? Okay. So um, this last example that I gave, where one person is at 10,000, I could have said a million, and everyone else is at one, you might question whether this is realistic, whether there actually are social institutions or arrangements that would result in numbers like that. And I think that's a good criticism. I think that that's correct, that probably there are not institutional arrangements that would make those numbers realistic. But we could think of other alternatives. I mean, we could make it more dramatic by supposing maybe that we could uh, arrange a society in which we made some people quite unhappy and made other people quite happy by enslaving some people. And we can imagine enslaving maybe a relatively small minority. <coughs> so if, if we enslave a small minority, of course we're going to make that small number of people quite unhappy. But if their unhappiness is compensated for by the increase in happiness of the vast majority, utilitarianism might say that this would be a, a worthwhile trade-off. Okay, so everybody sees that? So maybe that was the second example. Two people enslaved made very unhappy. Everybody else, they don't have to do the like, drudge work that those two people are doing anymore. They're made much happier. When we're talking about uh, morality, just 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 morality, not like Hobbes or anything else. What are we really talking about? Because it sounds like it's, it can be a lot of different things because what you were just giving this uh, description of doesn't sound like in today's world would justify anything as close to moral. Right, so this is why I'm presenting this as a what? A criticism of morality. It's a criticism of utilitarianism. So I'm, I'm presenting this now as an appeal to your moral sense. And when I say on this moral theory, Maybe we're going to be required or 